My subject today is partly forgotten heroes of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's worldwide mission. Indeed, some are not just largely forgotten now, they were never widely known at all. And yet they played a crucial role in the Adventist Church's effort to tell the world the good news of Christ and the prophetic truths embodied in the Angels of Revelation 14. So my purpose is partly to do posthumous justice to mission leaders whose contribution means they should be better known. But I'm also dealing with a second subject in this presentation. Ellen G. White instructed Adventists that from apostolic times the Church of Christ on earth was organized for missionary purposes. And a large part of my purpose is to explore how the Seventh-day Adventist Church organized for missionary purposes. Now this may not seem an exciting topic, but it's an essential one. Few, if any, church workers could have been sustained in foreign mission fields in the absence of an administrative structure undergirding them. In this presentation I explain how and why Adventist mission became successful in the early and mid 20th century. And at the end, I reflect a little on how things changed in the last 50 years. Seventh-day Adventists from their early days have been impelled by a strong theology of mission, believing that since ancient times, God's intent was that, in Ellen White's words, God's story, His character, His merciful kindness and tender love were to be revealed to all mankind. She affirmed, only Christian missionary work furnishes the church with a sure foundation. Moreover, Mrs. White was clear. The mission of the Adventist church, like its apostolic predecessor, remains to carry the gospel to the world. After many years hesitation about whether they should or even could carry the gospel and their distinctive prophetic truths, around the world and beyond the shores of North America, the pioneers of the Adventist Church grew to believe that the entire world was their vineyard to work. For, they were told by Ellen White, the Lord has marked every phase of missionary zeal that has been shown by His people in behalf of foreign fields. He designs that in every home, in every church, and at all the centers of the work, a spirit of liberality shall be shown in sending help to foreign fields. Or as she put it in 1900, the home missionary work will be farther advanced in every way when a more liberal, self-denying, self-sacrificing spirit is manifested for the prosperity of foreign missions. For the prosperity of the homework depends largely upon the reflex influence of the evangelical work done in countries afar off. How, however, were we to send help to foreign fields and to carry the gospel to the world? That's our subject for today. What the denomination had to do in order to be able to carry out its mission. Let me be clear what I mean by mission. Sometimes we confuse it with evangelism or outreach. But that happens in what Adventist church leaders of the early 20th century usually referred to simply as the home fields. Given that even in our numerical strongholds, in some parts of Africa, the Caribbean and the South Pacific, there is at most around one Adventist for every 10 people in a country, it is hard to imagine a time when outreach via personal witnessing, literature distribution, education and public evangelism won't be a task of the church. But that is not what I mean by mission. And it's not what our pioneers meant either when they simply talked of mission or missionaries as opposed to home mission. What I mean today is what Adventists for much of our history referred to simply as foreign mission. What does that mean in today's terms? Here I borrow terminology from the branch of the General Conference that historically was responsible for organizing and enacting our missionary enterprise, the General Conference Secretariat. It defines its role as providing administrative leadership and strategic direction to the world church in making disciples 
to reach the unreached. So, by mission, I mean cross-cultural mission, pioneering mission to unreached and underreached areas and people groups, mission that pushes back the bounds of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, geographically, numerically, ethnically, and or linguistically. This has always been the task of those home fields. And a wonderful part of the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is how the definition of home fields has never been static. It has been an ever-widening category so that now Brazil, Kenya, Mexico, the Philippines, countries that not long ago were still mission fields, are now mission heartlands, sending missionaries to other parts of the world. Now, the history of the first 25 years of Adventist missions and missionaries could be a separate presentation, indeed a whole book in itself. Having conducted a recent study of this topic, the main point, I think, to take away from Adventism's early efforts to engage in foreign mission is this. When it was done outside of the central leadership of the church and left either to lay groups or to competing committees and bodies, that often worked around the general conference leadership, it was done in a somewhat haphazard way. This is the case often because one body would assume another was taking care of certain details, while the other assumed likewise. Thus, duplication in some matters of planning and neglect to plan at all for other matters ultimately led to wasted efforts and inefficiency. At the end of it all, in spite of good intentions on the part of church leaders, the church as a whole and the General Conference headquarters failed to ignite the engine of foreign missions. So what changed? First, as part of the reorganization of 1901 to 1903, the General Conference assumed a greater responsibility for foreign mission. In 1901, it devolved much authority to the newly organized Union Conferences. In the words of veteran church leader Uriah Smith, the GC had distributed its administrative responsibilities among the union conferences in order to get into a position where it could give all its time and influence and power to missionary problems. At the 1903 GC session, the president elected in 1901, Arthur G. Daniels, who had spent a decade as a missionary in Australia and New Zealand, shared his vision of what ought to happen now. Daniels declared the administration in the United States is now placed in the hands of men appointed to that work in the East and the North and the South and in the Central and Western states. But while that has been going on, our missionary problems have been greatly increasing. As I've studied it, I've become convinced that one of the great purposes of the General Conference Committee should be to deal with these worldwide problems everywhere. He went on to argue that the General Conference Committee should be transformed from a small body into a large representative one, becoming what Daniels described as a world's conference committee. And he concluded, now that, to my mind, brethren, is what should be the missionary board of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. In 1889, the church had set up a foreign mission board, but it had operated as a semi-independent body, almost in rivalry to the GC administration. In 1903, it was superseded by the General Conference Executive Committee, reconstituted, as Daniels had suggested, making it the representative body we know today. And the General Conference Committee thenceforth was the Seventh-day Adventist Mission Board. This meant that all the growing authority and resources of the Executive Committee and of the GC Presidency and Administration, as well as the personal influence of the top leaders, were now dedicated to the Church's mission enterprise. The General Conference Committee's primary business was overseas mission. This was fundamental. Second was the development of new administrative structures within the General Conference, including a transition away from overlapping and competing associations to departments operating at each level of church structure, with guidance from leaders at the General Conference headquarters. In addition was the creation by J.C. Secretary Spicer and his secretariat team 
in the 20 years after 1903 of a complex system for recruiting, deploying and sustaining missionaries from the North American homeland and the new European and Australian heartlands in mission fields in Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, Asia and the islands of the Pacific. The church today essentially still uses the missionary systems developed during Spicer's secretaryship. We will come back to this crucial point about the development of administrative infrastructure in a moment. Third was the change in literal and figurative perspective by the move of the headquarters from Battle Creek, Michigan to Tacoma Park near Washington, D.C. The decision to move from Battle Creek had been yet another momentous decision taken at the 1903 General Conference session. The church headquarters itself began moving in August 1903. The publishing association followed and new institutions, a college and a sanitarium were founded as those in Battle Creek fell into the hands of John Harvey Kellogg. Yet as it turned out, escaping Kellogg's negative influence was only one of the benefits of the move from provincial Michigan to the nation's capital. As Daniels foresaw at the 1903 session, the move offered great opportunities for mission enterprise. Veteran missionary leader W.C. White had even seen an argument for locating the GC headquarters in London, though in the end he preferred to be at the U.S. national capital. Although neither Daniels nor White anticipated all the advantages that would accrue, they grasped the potential. In Washington, the church headquarters was close to the foreign embassies, to which requests for authorization to start work in new mission territories and applications for missionaries' visas had to be submitted. A vital, indeed indispensable, but laborious, complicated and time-consuming process, which was expedited by being adjacent to Washington. The presence of international banks in the national capital enabled the transmission of funds to and from church headquarters and mission stations around the world. Tacoma Park was on a major rail line, important for managing the mission homeland of North America, but also close to the large port of Baltimore, from which missionaries could sail or their possessions be shipped, while the even larger port of New York was easily accessible by train. New opportunities presented themselves by moving to the U.S. capital, and new horizons were opened, mental as well as geographical. This change was essential for a movement that now faced not inwards to Lake Michigan and the U.S. West and Midwest, but outwards across the oceans. Yet, the move away from Michigan enabled a global expansion in Adventist mission, but could not alone bring that about. The change of headquarters mattered because the priorities of church leaders had shifted, not just their homes. This brings us therefore to that group of leaders who, from 1903 onwards, managed the ma enlargement of the church's missionary enterprise. Fourth then was the vision and passion for mission shared by the general conference officers working together closely. Each year from 1903 to 1922, when Daniel was, was succeeded as president by Spicer, and indeed ever after, all three executive officers were passionate proponents of worldwide mission, especially to non-Christian people groups, something we'll come back to later in this presentation. I want to dwell on and to underscore the importance of actions taken by individuals in key leadership roles. Very often, when the story of the church's reorganization in 1901 to 1903 is told, it is one about structure. Now, the institution and mechanisms were very important, but so too were the personalities. The new organizational model adopted at the start of the 1900s made a difference as far as the foreign missionary program was concerned in large part because the GC offices after 1903 were determined to transform the missionary enterprise of the Adventist Church. Simply put, other offices would not have made as much of the organizational reforms as did Arthur Daniels, William Spicer, Irwin Evans and Walter Knox. 
Spicer and Daniels were general conference officers together until 1926. They and Evans, the treasurer from 1903 to 1909, and subsequently a division president and general vice president, were visionaries of global mission, as was W.C. White, who continued to exercise very considerable influence behind the scenes for many years. Walter Knox had not served outside the Americas, but he had visited Mexico, which then was the responsibility of the Pacific Union, where Knox had served. Above all, Knox shared the priorities of Daniels and developed Evans' work in building the financial infrastructure necessary to realize the common goal. Moreover, increasingly the men and women who were brought into departmental leadership and as support to the three officers had mission experience. By the 1920s, international experience had become in practice unofficially obligatory for senior positions at the world headquarters. Above all, however, I suggest it was Daniels and Spicer who took advantage of the organizational reforms to drive forward their vision of mission, which they then handed on. It was during the Daniels and Spicer administrations from 1901 through 1930 that Adventism truly became a worldwide movement. It did so in large part because the head of the church was also the head of its mission enterprise. In fact, both Daniels and Spicer essentially viewed the two roles as one. No longer was there lack of clarity about the respective powers of the mission board and the GC committee, resulting in paralysis. The executive committee now was the mission board, and it often used that title. Having just stressed the importance of personalities, however, I now want to take it back just a little because while the unconditional commitment of the President, Secretary and Treasurer to foreign mission was vital, personalities could only do so much. Without the development of the General Conference Secretariat as a command center for the missionary enterprise, church leaders' passion for reaching the world could not have been realized. To do that, systems and internal structures were needed and this is what Secretariat created and managed. And this does therefore bring us back, after all, to the importance of personality, because what was needed for foreign mission to flourish was leaders who had the same commitment as the top leaders, but at lower levels of the headquarters. And so although I am now going to talk about, as I said we would, the structures that were put in place under Spicer as Secretary, we are also going to be talking about People, the makers of modern mission. And here we come to the real unsung heroes. Now, Adventist history enthusiasts, or those who dimly remember classes in denominational history from school or college, will know the names of A.G. Daniels and W.A. Spicer. However, the names of I.H. Evans and W.T. Knox are much less well known. And the people we will talk about for the next little while were never widely known even a century ago. And yet, they each played a vital part in the making of the modern Adventist church and its worldwide mission. Thanks to their dedicated, unstinting efforts, the General Conference Secretariat became mission control for the Seventh-day Adventist church. And that was the essential foundation for the church's expansion. From the start of his secretaryship, W.A. Spicer had a strong concept of the importance of unity, including unity of action. Soon after his election, Spicer wrote in the review of two axiomatic mathematical truths, that the whole is equal to the sum of all its parts, and the whole is greater than any one of its parts, and he declared them equally applicable to the Adventist message as to arithmetic. He wrote, the message as a whole is composed of and is equal to the sum of all its different parts or divisions. The message as a whole is greater than any one of the parts. Under his leading, Secretariat was to demonstrate the virtue of unity of control in mobilizing unity of purpose for united action. To do so, however, 
Spicer needed assistance. His achievements were never those of a one-man band, and part of his leadership's success lay in building a team of one accord, an orchestra that performed under his direction. In 1904, two new positions subordinate to the secretary were created, Home Secretary and Statistical Secretary. These were assistants to the secretary, but above ordinary clerical staff. Estella Hauser, who had been on the staff of the Foreign Mission Board in the 1890s, became the first GC Home Secretary. Harvey Edson Rogers, who had worked in clerical positions at the GC headquarters since January 1889 and had been statistical clerk since April 1901, was appointed first General Conference Statistical Secretary. He is my ultimate predecessor because the post of Statistical Secretary evolved into Director of Archives, Statistics and Research. No photograph of Estella Hauser is known, unfortunately. She resigned as Home Secretary in 1906 to complete medical studies and she later served as a missionary doctor. She was replaced by Tyler E. Bowen, who had been Secretary Treasurer of two conferences in North America. Bowen continued in senior positions in GC Secretariat for 35 years. He retired in 1941 and so too did Rogers, whose 37 years in a senior secretariat position are a record. This photo, by the way, shows Rogers at age 30 in 1897, after he joined the church headquarters as a clerk. This photo is Edson Rogers, which is what his colleagues called him, photographed in 1943, showing the strain of 37 years of managing the church's statistics. Edson Rogers was responsible for the renewed publication of the Seventh-day Adventist Yearbook in 1904, after an interval of nine years. He initiated publication of the standalone annual statistical report in 1907. It was a separate book, whereas in the past the statistical report had appeared in the pages of church periodicals. Both books are still published every year. The creation of a separate statistical publication gave church statistics greater prominence amongst church leaders. But in addition, Rogers in the annual statistical report did more than summarize reported numbers. He analyzed the numbers that he had gathered. As the influential Adventist author Arthur Spaulding, who knew Rogers, put it after he'd passed away, the gathering of statistics before Rogers was partial and fragmentary. He expanded and systematized the work. The addition of Rogers to the secretary's team was vital, for as it accumulated more data, the secretariat took over the role of planning, deliberately and purposely, for expanding mission. In the 1910s and 1920s, secretariat itself continued to expand in size. Mission planning, managing requests from mission fields for missionaries, finding and processing missionary recruits, and dispatching them to the fields took more and more time and more staff. In 1915, the General Conference Committee set up a subcommittee to consider how the headquarters could achieve both greater efficiency and greater connection with the world field. Acting on its report, the Executive Committee voted in order to increase the staff of general workers, in order to compass the work of keeping in touch with the fields, that it should create a new position, Assistant Secretary of the General Conference. That post was filled by this man, John L. Shaw, who was called from the presidency of Washington Missionary College to become the first Assistant Secretary. Shaw had been a missionary to India for many years and was a protege of William Spicer. Uniquely for a General Conference Assistant or Associate Secretary, Shaw became General Conference Treasurer elected in 1922. Shaw was an active proponent of foreign missions and of foreign mission service, on which subjects he wrote numeral, numerous articles for church papers. As an educator, he also got Secretariat to make a priority of promoting mission on the campuses of Adventist colleges in home field countries. This for many decades was a regular annual part of the duties of the assistant 
and associate secretaries. The Secretariat staff had to liaise with union conferences in North America, Europe and Australasia, each of which was, as W.C. White urged, a recruiting agency for foreign missionaries. This liaison work initially fell to Tyler Bowen. For decades he oversaw the process of obtaining visas and permits for missionaries to enter foreign nations and the colonies of imperial powers. The process was so complex that Secretariat created a system of matching complexity for processing missionary recruits. Separate stages were identified, which were then tracked for each missionary family, including what visa or permit was needed, when applications for those permits were submitted, and if or when a visa or permit was received by Secretariat and the missionary. Secretariat also tracked the additional steps for obtaining a U.S. or other national passport, and copies of all correspondence with embassies were kept mostly in a central register. This could all be very time-consuming as well as complex. This is what a British embassy official dismissively told Bowen in July 1916 in a telephone conversation regarding Charles and Eva Lowry, who the church had called to serve in Burma, then part of British India. The embassy official said, considerable time must elapse before the necessary permission can be obtained from the government of India. What followed was a correspondence that took more than three weeks and included application forms being returned at least twice because insufficient copies had been submitted. Charles and Eva Lowry did go as missionaries to Burma, arriving on September 18, 1916, seven weeks and one day after Bowen's telephone conversation. Tragically, Charles Lowry died of smallpox only three years later. But he and Eva had arrived in Burma when they did because of the system that Secretariat had created and which Tyler Bowen managed. Bowen's interest in, an, in a missionary did not cease when he or she departed overseas. Bowen maintained a voluminous correspondence with missionaries in the field, often dealing with logistical or technical matters relating to their work, but also encouraging them and sending them news of the church. In late 1916, Petra Tunheim, a Norwegian-American missionary to the Dutch East Indies, today Indonesia, wrote fulsomely to Boehm from Java, thanking him, quote, for your very kind and cheery letter. It gave me such a joy to read it. Just over seven years later, the pioneer missionary to South America, Ferdinand Stahl, wrote from Peru telling Bowen, if I should get a letter from you every day, I would not think it too much. Your letters have always been of great encouragement to us. With the conducting of analysis and projections and the management of missionaries, in addition to keeping in touch with the church around the world, and the duties of the secretary as an officer of the General Conference. The General Conference Secretariat was growing both in influence and in size. Its importance was both recognized and underscored at the 1918 General Conference session which created a new position, Associate Secretary, which unlike the Assistant and Statistical Secretaries was one of the officers of the General Conference. Assistant Secretary John Shaw became the first ever GC Associate Secretary in 1918. The Assistant Secretaryship was then left vacant until filled in January 1921 by the 33-year-old Australian Cecil Myers. Spicer was elected General Conference President in 1922 and Myers succeeded him as Secretary, while, as I noted earlier, Spicer's devoted Lieutenant J.L. Shaw transition from Associate Secretary to General Conference Treasurer. But as President Spicer continued, in any case, to set the tone and to stress the importance of Secretariat's roles. Four years later, the 1926 session amended the Constitution again to provide for multiple, initially two Associate Secretaries. 
Since the 1940s, there have typically been six or seven associate secretaries who for much of the 20th century were responsible for liaison with divisions, for promoting mission, and for recruiting and managing missionaries. What we have covered thus far begs at least a couple of questions. Did Secretariat have an overarching concept of what it was seeking to do? And if so, what was it? Most fundamentally, Secretariat sought to expand the boundaries of foreign mission, entering unentered territories, reaching unreached people groups, as we would call them today. Simply put, foreign mission was the top priority of Secretariat. It is striking, for example, that Spicer titles several of his GC session reports simply as the mission field outlook, even though he covered the whole world. And by mission field, he meant those areas outside the mission homelands of North America, Central and Western Europe, and Australasia. In his session report, Spicer distinguished between home and foreign fields, between mission lands and home bases. He spent much of his time talking about the foreign fields. When he turned to speak of the home fields at length, it was, for example, to describe approvingly how North America had provided 571 out of 708 missionaries in one quadrennium, and how North American conferences were sharing their tithe to pay foreign missionaries, and were promoting the weekly mission offerings throughout all their churches. Furthermore, for the first 60 years of the 20th century, Secretariat had a core concept of mission, one that reflected Ellen G. White's mission priorities. From 1890 to 1900, serving as a missionary herself in Australia, en route to which she stopped in some South Pacific islands, Mrs. White began to plead for greater efforts to reach Africa, China, India, Japan, and Pacific Islands. After 1903, she began to stress ever more clearly that Adventist mission had to encompass the whole earth, including those who live beyond the bounds of Christendom. She increasingly emphasized mission to adherents of non-Christian religions in the last years of her life. It is clear, moreover, that for Daniels, Spicer, Shaw, Myers, and others, the chief desire was to enter unentered territory, to preach Christ to those who did not know him. Those leaders, particularly Daniels and Spicer, who had personally worked closely with Ellen White, had internalized and now began to operationalize her perspective on reaching the whole earth. This was the overarching objective of Daniels and Spicer in their presidencies, and two of Spice's protege and successor as president, Charles Watson, who as president in Australasia had actively promoted mission to Southeast Asia and to the South Pacific. All of these leaders wanted to see the home fields converted as well, but then believing Ellen White's counsel that the prosperity of the homework depends largely upon the reflex influence of the evangelical work done in countries afar off, they believed that, in words written by Spicer, when the witness has been born abroad, the work may be finished at home in short order. The reflex influence of a missionary crusade that shall sweep the world will of itself prepare believers to rise and finish the work in this country. All these leaders were happy, of course, to see Catholics, members of Orthodox and Eastern churches and nominal Christians of other Protestant denominations converted, becoming more authentic followers of Jesus Christ, but all had a particular burden for converting adherents of what missiologists today call the world religions. This is how Spicer later summarized Adventist attitudes in the early 1890s when he was serving as a missionary. We didn't have much of an idea of going to the heathen. We didn't expect to go in any really strong way. We never expected to go to the Catholic countries. We thought, we will get a few along the edges and the Lord will come. 
But the Lord all the time had in mind this purpose of calling the heathen, of calling through all the Catholic lands for his people to come. In 1899, Spicer wrote from India, The world is one field and the harvest surely will not be gathered in any place until the whole is ripened. It is a characteristic appeal, but also it articulates a message that was consistent throughout his career. At the 1922 session, at which he was elected General Conference President, for example, Spicer affirmed simply but eloquently that the church is one fellowship in all the world. Others may have a church south and a church north, a work in one continent independent of all the others, but with us it is one field, and in all the world it is one people, our folks, all of them, of many nations and tongues, the people of the prophecy of Revelation 14. What was the impact of this focus on pushing back the bounds of mission? It was, I suggest, the making of Adventist mission. And more, the making of the modern Adventist church as a worldwide church. There are two obvious ways that this can be gauged statistically. Two measures of impact. The first is membership. And not just the total of the membership, but the geographic distribution of church members. First, note that the 1900 membership increased by 38% in the first decade of the 20th century. In the second decade, growth was more than 77% despite World War I. And then, even though growth becomes more difficult as movements grow larger, in the 1920s, total church membership grew by another 70%. Yet also striking is where the members were. The chart on the screen shows the balance between membership in North America and the rest of the world between 1875, when Adventist missionary work had only just begun, and 1965, when the North American proportion dropped below one quarter for the first time. The dashed line shows the membership in North America, the solid line shows the total membership in the rest of the world combined. The tipping point years are 1920 and 1921. In 1920, the North American membership was 51.7% of the total, and the rest of the world's share was 48.3%. The corresponding figures in 1921 were 49.83 and 50.17%. Thus, 1921 was the year that membership beyond North America finally exceeded that in the original homeland. Meanwhile, 1917 was the last year that more than 50% of global accessions were within North America. In other words, by the early 1920s, Adventism was truly a global faith. That was the achievement of the thousands of church members who not only tithed faithfully, but gave faithfully to mission offerings, and of the many hundreds of missionaries who served quite literally at risk to their lives, and in many cases sacrificing connection to their families, even to their parents and children. However, it was also the achievement of the men and women who worked in secretariat at the World Church headquarters, without whom the missionaries would not have been recruited in the same numbers and could never have been sent or sustained in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and the South Pacific. The second way of measuring the impact is in the number of missionaries. Having said many hundreds served, the obvious question is how many? And here I want to make a transition as I draw to a conclusion from the distant past to the near past and to the present. The chart on the screen shows the number of new missionaries sent out to service each year from 1901 when the church reorganized the mission until 2019. By the way, until 1979, the only measurement the church kept of its missionaries or interdivisional employees, as they were dubbed in 1983, was the number of new missionaries, or IDEs, who sailed 
for foreign missions, the language the church used up to the 1950s, or entered service each year. You can see that World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II all had a negative impact on missionary numbers, but that there was overall a steady rise until 1970. Then there was a decline in the 1970s and early 80s, stability or stagnation in the late 80s and the 1990s, and since then a marked decline. This is more evident in this version of the chart on the screen now, which adds a trend line. This smooths out the inevitable spikes and troughs of annualized figures, but while it shows clearly the growth in the number of new missionaries each year in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the current direction of the trend line is disturbing. The chart on the screen now shows the number of IDEs, retitled International Service Employees, a few years ago. The number actually in service each year from 1979 through 2019. You can see the numbers declining, then rebounding in the 1990s, but then again declining from the year 2000 before achieving a kind of stability in the mid-2010s. Now, calls for missionaries come from divisions. So those trends don't reflect a GC decision that missionaries aren't a priority. Indeed, it doesn't really reflect a deliberate decision at all. But sometimes decisions are taken by omission as well as by commission, by what we let happen. And this trend does reflect, I suggest, a collective decision of that type by church leaders around the world over the last 40 years. Is this trend the right one? Of course, it partly reflects the success of Adventist mission. As we touched on at the beginning, regions that were mission fields, even until quite recently, are now best thought of as home fields. But the myth that success has given rise to is that the church's mission work is done. And it is a prevalent and persistent myth. I hear it often as I travel, though especially in the traditional mission homelands of North America, Western Europe, and Australasia. Yet the reality is that there are still large areas and huge populations that have been barely accessed by Adventists. So the need for missionaries is no less. The reality too is that while in many parts of the world local people can do outreach and do it not only more cost effectively but also more successfully than foreigners, there are divisions and unions that lack the resources, whether of funds or of people, to evangelize their own territory. There is thus, I believe, no less a need for missionaries than 100 years ago. What I hope you will take from this presentation is, first, a degree of respect for the makers of modern mission. Second, a recognition of the need for there still to be a mission control at the General Conference which coordinates and synergizes resources from around the world and especially from places where the church is strong, deploying them to places where the church is weak. That has been our way since 1863, but it became ever more our way after 1903 with the results that we have seen it still needs to be our way as a world church today. Third, I hope you will be inspired by the commitment of the makers of modern mission, inspired to pray, to give, and to encourage others to pray, to give, and to volunteer to serve. The world church still needs a mission program, and it needs the support of every church member for it to be a success. If you want to know more, then you can find resources at these websites, adventistarchives.org, adventistdocuments.org, and adventiststatistics.org. And you can read thousands of stories of missionaries and mission institutions on the online encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists.
available at encyclopedia.adventist.org. In addition, this summer ASTR will be publishing a book on the subject of my presentation with the title, We Aim at Nothing Less Than the Whole World, The Seventh-day Adventist Church's Missionary em Enterprise, 1900-2020. That title is taken from a statement by William Spicer, but I believe it is as true today as a hundred years ago, we aim at the whole world for Christ. Thank you for joining.